Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking Soccer. I am Justin Horniker and today we are going to decide if we still need the MLS Super Draft in the year 2022 or 2023 as MLS likes to think it is. I come to this thought just by, you know, really diving into the results of this past week's MLS Super Draft course covering it for St. Louis City in their first draft and we'll get a little bit more into the specifics and who I thought had a good night who you know maybe overpaid maybe didn't show up but when you dive into what actually happened draft pick by draft pick you come to this understanding that things are just needlessly complicated and that's kind of if you're familiar with MLS at all that is probably the bare minimum. You probably would have understood just by the fact that they don't, they don't call it a draft. They call it a super draft. That it was needlessly complicated. Did you know that it's called the super draft because you can pick players that weren't necessarily from the college ranks? From You can pick players from MLS Next Pro, for instance, like multiple teams did in this that I wasn't aware was possible before the draft happened. It's needlessly complicated. <laughs> To the point where, all right, so let's let's go to the second round where Philadelphia Union selected their own player in Stefan Stojanovic. Stefan Stojanovic plays for the Union 2 this past year, but he comes from the college ranks. He played for SLU for two seasons and before, you know, eventually making his way to the reserve side, signing a reserve contract with the Philadelphia Union 2, which is the important distinction. So, what the Super Draft does, it essentially gives you contractual rights to these players, and depending on if they're Generation Adidas players or if they're just straight draft picks, they are on your roster and you can move them up and down without consequence. Whereas Stajanovic only had an MLS Next Pro contract, in order for him to be brought up to the Union at any point throughout the year, he would have to sign a pro, a MLS-specific first-team contract. So... Now that they've drafted him with their second round draft pick, they can now move him wherever. He's essentially an academy player now. So it's a good thing for those kind of roster mechanics, but I would argue that why do we have these roster mechanics in the first place? It breaks my brain (laughs) thinking about it because essentially what you're doing is is you are controlling where players can sign, where players can play. You are controlling, essentially, the earning power that these players have. I'm very pro-player in all the talking I do. I think that the more choices players have, it doesn't just help out the players, it helps out the quality of play. And players will sign wherever there is an opportunity. There is this argument that if you don't have restricted free agency, if you don't have homegrown rights, if you don't have all these mechanisms that we have in Major League Soccer, and we have them in NWSL and USL too, in these Americanized concepts of roster restrictions, that players will only sign for large market teams. And that just is simply not true. If you look over in Europe, if you look everywhere in the top leagues in the world, Players are signing with clubs that are not large market clubs. I mean, (laughs) it just is a ridiculous thought. So now we're in a situation where you have to draft your own players to have complete control over whether or not you can move them up and down your roster. I think, for my money, college players should just be able to sign with wherever they want to sign. Instead, you have teams constantly drafting their homegrown kids. So St. Louis City drafting John Klein, who played at St. Louis, who's from Columbia, Missouri, and is very much a St. Louis Scott Gallagher product, very much would probably have signed with St. Louis even if they didn't draft him. And now you have to go out and sign your own players. It's, again, just something that doesn't need to exist when you have such a robust a robust academy system starting to take its place in the U.S. And that's the other thing, too, is that there were a lot of confusion. And, you know, I am a little bit familiar with this as someone who writes for, about St. Louis City and 
St. Louis, of course, inaugural MLS draft. For people who aren't necessarily as familiar with what the Super Draft is, you're coming into this with your kind of North American sports mindset, and you see your team trade the first round pick for $450,000 in GAM, and you think that it's a missed opportunity. But what you maybe don't realize as a first time draft watcher is that there aren't really any hits per se with that first round pick. Now, that don't get me wrong, I think that Hamadi Diop is fine. I think that Shakir Muhammad would have been a fine pick. Um, and who St. Louis end up getting in the top 10 Owen O'Malley, I like a whole lot. But what if those players could just sign wherever they want to sign? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm out of my mind. But what the draft comes down to is an opportunity for teams to wash their assets in a way. So if you look at, you know, throughout the first 10 picks of this draft, only one team, Sporting Kansas City, actually made a draft pick with their initial pick. They were the only team to not either trade into the top 10 or trade out of the top 10. If you have a draft where no one wants to hold on to their draft picks, I think that inherently tells you that the draft picks aren't valuable to everyone. You see that with the Philadelphia Union. The Union build their team through their academy. And that plays its way through the draft too. Philadelphia Union rarely make a first round draft pick. And this year they picked a goalkeeper in the 28th pick, picked their own player in the second round. Like it's clear that they don't necessarily view it as a way to get high priced assets that you completely control the way that they've come up into the game that, you know, you know, are in tune with their values as a team and as a club. Like, I just think we get to the point where, yes, there are players that come out of the draft who are very good. Your Daryl DKs, your Jack Harrisons, for instance, your Dominic Bajis, your Kyle Lauren, your Jack Harrison, Julian Gressel, Jackson Yule. These players all come from college soccer, all come, you know, from the draft. But you can still get those players from college soccer if you just let them sign somewhere, is my my whole point with this video. College soccer is a very good pathway. And, you know, maybe in a pie in the sky, you know, idyllic world, we wouldn't necessarily have college soccer. Everything would just be down to the clubs. But there are some very good coaches in the NCAA. There are some very good teams in the NCAA. And for all intents and purposes, college soccer is this country's second tier. If you take a Creighton versus, let's say, Louisville City of the USL, I think, you know, if you played seven games, it's a decently close series. Now, you're talking 20-year-olds against grown men, but I think the talent at the NCAA level shows that there's a lot of players that can play top-flight MLS, that can play MLS Next Pro, that can play USL, but just wanted to experience college, wanted to go to college, wanted to get a degree, and you do it by playing soccer, and maybe you can find opportunities elsewhere to, to continue your pro career. These, your Jackson Yules, your Jack Elliott's, your Julian Gressel's will always have the college pathway, but what if we just allowed them to sign wherever they wanted to sign, or whoever could you know promise them the pathway that they wanted? That doesn't seem too crazy to me. It just seems needlessly complicated. So let's dive into the draft a bit. I want to kind of give my thoughts on who did well, who maybe reached a little bit, and then we'll we'll tie it up into a nice little bow. And I will try to answer if we still need the Super Draft in 2022-2023. So to kind of recap exactly what happened in the first round of this draft and, you know, where a lot of the action really happened. So, of course, the draft is in St. Louis. This is a pretty good day for St. Louis. I wrote a piece on this Talking Soccer Medium publications. We'll have a link down below. Just talking about how even before a pick was even made, this is a pretty big win for St. Louis. Not just because they get to showcase the stadium, they get to showcase the facilities, but because before the first pick kicked off, Charlotte FC was giving St. Louis $450,000 in general allocation money, some for this season, some for next season. And swapped the first round pick for the 20th the first overall pick for the 20th overall pick so a pick swap plus 400k in gam 
that's a pretty good day. And the move told you a couple things about St. Louis City's mindset, about Luke's fantasy deals, about Bradley Carnell's mindset with his team that they're building. It told you that they weren't necessarily interested in the perceived number one overall pick in Chuck Muhammad. There was probably a GA pick, which there was, um, that fit their need later on down the draft where they could trade back into the top 10. And 450k in GAM, it's a pretty good day, especially when you use a quarter of that to get the number nine pick. And then you're essentially you know, covering the Tim Parker trade with Houston by trading out of the first overall pick. That's an absolute win. No matter how Ono Malley and John Klein end up being for St. Louis down the line, which I think they'll both be fantastic. At some point, they'll see the field. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but they'll be a good part of this organization, even as a sub option or a rotated roster option. They're fluid attacking players. Uh, O'Malley can play right back. He can play midfield. John Klein is your kind of prototypical attacking midfielder. And they both have you know strong technical ability while still being aggressive, having a high work rate. That's exactly what this team wants to build, that Red Bull style play. So when that kicks things off, you know that you're in for a wild day. <laughs> Orlando City move into pick number two. They did that earlier in the day, which I think kind of drove up the cost for that number one pick. Uh, they... I don't know what Orlando City wanted to do here. So they trade their right back to move to the number two pick with DC, and then they trade Shaq Muhammad. But I was wondering, you know, are they moving to that pick thinking that they'll grab Hamadi Diop, who Charlotte ended up picking as a, I don't want to say a reach, but a bit of a reach for number one. But anyway, so Ruan's gone. They get Shakur Muhammad, who I think is very good. I watched a lot of footage of Shak Muhammad over the past couple of days, just kind of getting ready in the anticipation that St. Louis might pick him. And he's definitely the most dynamic player of this draft in terms of just, you know, outright striker, can play with the ball at his feet, can be a target man. I think that's a very good pickup. Moise Bambito was picked third by Colorado. They were able to get that pick via the Mark Anthony K deal with Toronto. Joshua Bulma is picked fourth by New England, who traded with San Jose for picks four and pick 10 and $250,000 a game. So pick swap plus $250,000 a game. That kind of, if you think about, you know, if we're thinking about the GAM economy, so number one picks 450K with the pick swap, Number four pick with a pick swap, 250K. So we got it. we're kind of getting there, right? Uh, <laughs> JC Nagando is picked in fifth. Uh, Vancouver acquired that pick via trade with Houston for 250000 and a pick swap. So, you know, about the same, number four, number five. Duncan McGuire, forward out of Creighton. Uh, Orlando have this pick via the Cash Mueller. Chris Mueller cash okay Chris Mueller trade and $250,000 in GAM cash Elijah Paul is picked seventh by Real Salt Lake who get that deal by $175,000 in GAM to Atlanta so all right now you're now you're dropping uh SKC keep their pick to draft Stephen Afrifa and St. Louis trade back in to the top 10 trade to the ninth pick with Seattle for $175,000 okay, in GAM and their third round pick Sure. And then the 10th round pick, Daniel Muni, of course, SJ, San Jose, get this pick with their the swap with New England. So a lot of pick swaps, a lot of game being thrown around and be continuing to be thrown around. Uh, my favorite is the 20th pick, Austin FC pick, Valentin Null. Austin acquired that pick from St. Louis earlier. St. Louis acquired the pick via Charlotte. And then Charlotte acquired that pick via trade in December of 2021 for international slots and $500,000 a game. So that that pick's gotten around a bit, my friends. All this to say, again, needlessly complicated, especially in the second round, you had quite a few MLS Next Pro players being picked. Uh, you can look at it, especially with Maximilian Arfston being picked by Columbus. Arfston played for San Jose Earthquake, Earthquakes, their second team in MLS Next Pro, and Arfston was picked with a 14th pick by Columbus. Thing where everyone turned around and said, you could do that? You can make that pick? And 
I think that tells you when a team with the 14th pick is doing something just like completely off the table, where it's to the point where they didn't even have a graphic for him on the MLS draft broadcast. That tells you, yeah, you probably aren't putting too much of an emphasis on this draft. So, all that being said, I think Charlotte maybe reach a little bit, but you know, if you have to reach to get your player and you're just dealing funny money and gam, gam's important, but you know. I don't think it's the biggest thing. It's not going to make or break your roster build. Uh, I think Orlando City did fine. Moving out a player who, you know, it's questionable if he was going to re-sign down the line, if they're going to be able to hold on to him long-term. So you deal a player, you replace him with a young, exciting forward, much like they did with Daryl DK a few years back. And they also had the sixth pick where they picked up Duncan McGuire. So Orlando City had a pretty good day, even though they threw around some gam to get there. And then besides for that, Elijah Paul, I actually like a lot too. That's another good player. But Elijah Paul, also Real Salt Lake's own academy product that they have to then acquire via draft because he had gone to college and gone elsewhere. And I don't know. It's just like when I look at the draft, I think it's great for identifying players, identifying talent, and giving players in a way in. But I think we could do so much better if we just allow teams to sign players who are done with their college eligibility. Now, what do you do with your Generation Adidas players, your players that come out early? Maybe, you know, you just tell them that they have to declare if they're going to sign. And I don't know. I think that's a pretty easy solution to the point where you're not watching a first round where someone takes someone else is reserved player with their 14th draft like that in and of itself just throws all legitimacy of this being a uh, something that's like must watch out the window <laughs> and i don't know there there's so many tweaks you could do with the super draft that i just think at this time and age for every player every daryl dk you have there are also just tons of players that you know, don't end up contributing for their teams. And maybe if you just didn't have this mechanism, if you just allow teams to sign who they wanted to sign, it wouldn't be such an issue. So anyway, that's my take on the 2022-2023 MLS Super Draft. Let me know in your comments down below. I'm sure you will on what you think about it and uh, how pro what pro rel would just change and fix everything. Uh, if you're just stumbling upon this video and you like what I had to say, give me a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. I put out content all the time. And we will talk very, very soon, my friends.